Good morning, everyone. I'm Mrs. Bearden. I'm a librarian from St. Tammany Parish Schools. Welcome back to my story time. I'm so glad you could join me. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about the wheel and the axle in science. I know you all have talked about simple machines at some point, such as the screw, the pulley, the incline plane. But today, our story has to do with the wheel and axle. And I'm wondering, how many of you have ever ridden on a Ferris wheel before? I want you to think about where you were when you rode it. What did you see? What did you hear? What did you feel on the inside and the outside? It is exciting and you can see so much from up in the air when you're on a Ferris wheel. But I want you to know that the Ferris wheel was invented a long time ago by a man named Mr. Ferris. Take a look at this picture behind me. What do you see? Right, it's the Eiffel Tower. That's right, it's located in Paris, France. So the Eiffel Tower in 1889 was the tallest building in the world. It's hard to imagine because our buildings are so much taller than that now. Now look at this new picture behind me. This is the 10-story home insurance building in Chicago. In 1885, it was the tallest skyscraper. Now imagine that. Skyscrapers are way taller than 10 stories today. So if you can imagine that the Eiffel Tower is the tallest building and the home insurance building is the tallest skyscraper, then you are ready for today's story. Let's get started. And without further ado, our story, Mr. Ferris and His Wheel. Written by Katherine Gibbs Davis and illustrated by Gilbert Ford. It was only 10 months until the next World's Fair, but everyone was still talking about the star attraction of the last World's Fair. At 81 stories, France's Eiffel Tower was the world's tallest building. Its pointy iron and air tower soared so high, the visitors to the top could see Paris in one breathtaking sweep. Completed in 1889, the Eiffel Tower stood at 986 feet, surpassing America's Washington Monument to become the world's tallest man-made structure. Now it was America's turn to impress the world at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. But what could outshine the famous French Tower? And who would build it? A nationwide contest was announced. Before TV and the internet, people from around the globe gathered at the World's Fairs to share their different ways of life and new technologies. Tasty inventions such as the hamburger and the Cracker Jack first appeared there. Well, contest drawings poured in from all around the country, but most of the plans looked like the Eiffel Tower, only bigger. The fair judges said no to every last one. Was this really the best that American engineers could muster? To an ambitious young civil engineer, this contest was more than a dare. It was a matter of national pride. George Washington Gale Ferris Jr. had already designed some of the country's biggest bridges, tunnels, and roads. He could never allow a French tower to overshadow America's World's Fair. Why? Hadn't the United States built the world's first skyscraper? George had seen the elegant steel frame rise 10 stories high with his own eyes. Supported by a metal frame instead of solid walls, Chicago's home insurance building was the world's first skyscraper. Bird cages were the inspiration for the metal frame. Fancy that. George had an idea. An idea for a structure that would dazzle and move. Not just stand still like the Eiffel Tower. Back at his drawing board in Pittsburgh, he and his engineering partner, William Grinnell, measured and remeasured. A mistake of even an inch could bring their invention crashing down. 
George arrived in Chicago and made his case to the construction chief of the fair. The chief stared at George's drawing. No one had ever created a fair attraction that huge and that complicated. The chief told George that his structure was so flimsy it would collapse. George had heard enough. He rolled up his drawings and said, you're an architect, sir. I am an engineer. George knew something the chief did not. His invention would be delicate looking and strong. It would be both stronger and lighter than the Eiffel Tower because it would be built with an amazing new metal, steel. George was a steel expert and his structure would be made of a steel alloy. Alloys combine a super strong mix of hard metal with two or more chemical elements. The judges could not decide. Fall turned to winter as they dilly-dallied. In only four months, the fair would open and it still had no star attraction. Finally desperate, they agreed to give George's far-fetched idea a try, but they would not give him one penny for the materials to build it. The clock was ticking. George dashed from bank to bank asking for help, but when he began describing his invention, the lenders, they laughed him into the streets. So George used his own savings and convinced a few wealthy investors to join him. Still short of money, he boldly went ahead and ordered the parts he needed from a dozen different steel mills. In January 1893, George's construction crew began work on the foundation. Shovels broke as the workers tried digging into the frozen ground. It was one of the most brutally cold winters in all of Chicago's history. Blast, George ordered his crew to dynamite the icy earth, but what they found underneath was scarier still. Quicksand, the deadly muck, could suck man or machine under in seconds. The frost at the wheel site was three feet deep, the quicksand 20 feet in depth and saturated with water, said Luther V. Rice, construction and operations manager. Pumps were kept running night and day to keep out the water and live steam had to be used to thaw the sand and broken stone. George and his brave workers kept frantically digging. Finally, 35 feet down, they hit solid ground. They planted two huge steel towers deep into the earth, bolted them to crossbars of steel, and poured in cement to hold it all in place. Then they carefully lowered a 70-ton axle with fittings, the weight of a mogul locomotive train. Between them, this sturdy structure would hold the gigantic invention steady in even the strongest of Chicago's winds. At 45 feet long, the axle, a metal rod, was the largest piece of steel ever forged, and a boy helped to hammer it into shape at the Bethlehem Iron Works. As time grew shorter, freight trains from all over the country chugged onto the fairgrounds, loaded with more than 100,000 parts. Workers hurried to fit all the pieces together like a giant Lego toy. Hammers pounded nonstop in the breathless race to finish. Responsible for the wheel's many structural details, George's partner was losing hope. See the people down here? In the speech bubbles, it says, It's undignified. Stand back, dear. It might collapse. Bet you the wind will blow Ferris's folly into the lake. Nope. It'll fall first. It's going up way too fast. They say Ferris has wheels in his head. Frequently, I was discouraged and ready to give up. But through the encouragement of Mr. Ferris, 
Work was always resumed. That was written by William Grinnell, his partner. Finally, with only two months left, the last section was bolted into place, and there stood a perfect, enormous circle, 834 feet in circumference, rising 265 feet above the ground, and designed to move with the precision of the smallest watch. It looked exactly how George had first imagined it back as a boy on his ranch in Nevada. I learned something in this story. This is amazing. Living near the shore of Nevada's Carson River, George had often watched the water wheel turn around and round. Many times he had imagined shrinking to the size of one of his toy soldiers and hitching a ride up, up, and away in one of its wooden buckets. That's where George got the idea for the Ferris wheel. That's fascinating. Still, the biggest test was yet to come. The monster wheel had to spin, and George's elegant passenger cars still had to be hung. The tireless crew worked day and night to attach them. Each was the size of a whole living room with enormous picture windows and 40 velvet seats. George's wheel worked like a bicycle wheel. Both are supported by skinny, flexible rods called spokes. As the wheel turns, the spokes work together to share the weight. These are called tension wheels. On June 21st, 1893, opening day finally arrived. Think about that. He started building it in January. It's now June. Didn't take him long to build that big Ferris wheel. 2,000 people gathered as flags waved. George took the stage and dedicated his wheel to the noble profession of engineering. Then George's wife presented him with a beautiful golden whistle. George and his wife stepped proudly into car number one, followed by their nervous but excited guests. Uniform guards closed and locked the door. Would the wheel work? Why do you think they were nervous? The guests were nervous because they weren't sure if this was going to work or even be safe. But Mr. Ferris, he was confident of his work. George blew the golden whistle. 2,000 tons of steel began to turn around as the soft clanking of a large chain drove the mighty machine up, up, up the car, quietly floated above the mud and the noise. Two steam engines, an extra one in case one broke, made the wheel turn. George had hidden them under the wooden platform where the riders boarded. As the car was lifted higher, everyone rose from the velvet seats and crowded to the windows. Spread out below them was a dizzying sweep of the fairgrounds, the city of Chicago, sparkling Lake Michigan, and even glimpses of three faraway states. Below, more cars were loaded, and after the people had gone two times around and had 20 glorious airborne minutes in motion, powerful brakes brought the wheel to a whisper soft stop. When the conductor called all out, everyone begged to go around again. The wheel is safe. The news raced through the fairgrounds, through the city of Chicago, and across the country. All summer, visitors from around the world traveled to Chicago's World Fair. It didn't matter whether one was a senator, a farmer, a boy or girl. Everyone wanted to take a spin on the magnificent wheel. Adventurous couples asked to get married on it. On hot, steamy days, the wheel was the perfect place to escape up, up into the cooling breezes. All you needed was 50 cents. During the 19 weeks the wheel was in operation, 1.5 million passengers rode it. 
it revolved more than 10,000 times, withstood gale force winds and storms, and it did not need not even one repair. I'd say it was safe. At night, George's Ferris wheel became a magical glowing circle with 3,000 electric light bulbs, another brand new invention. As the queen of the midway made its stately rotation, so did the seasons. Soon, a fall chill filled the air and fair visitors began to thin out. In the late 1800s, homes were still lit with kerosene lamps and candles. The Chicago World's Fair helped reassure people that electricity was safe. At night, farmers and sailors from as far away as 40 miles could see the wheel's spectacular blaze of lights. On October 26, 1893, just before midnight, the immense twinkling spinning circle slowed to its final stop. The Chicago World's Fair was over. George had called his creation a monster wheel, but his investors renamed it after its inventor, the Ferris wheel. The Chicago Fair, or the White City, inspired two more magical places, the Emerald City in the classic children's book, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum and Disneyland. Walt Disney's father was a construction worker on the fair. He told his son stories about the dreamlike city he had helped build, and young Walt grew up to build the famous amusement parks that stay open all year round. That's interesting. Visitors returned to their homes to tell the story of the world's greatest ride, and before long, copies of the Ferris wheel began popping up all around the world. In 1894, the next Ferris wheel appeared in California on a cliff overlooking the Pacific Ocean. Lit up at night, it was the first landmark seen by ships finding their way home. Today, Ferris wheels are the most familiar and beloved carnival ride at state fairs and amusement parks. A ride on one still feels like flying to the moon in oh, 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 the view. Since 1893, there have been several tallest ever Ferris wheels, and the race continues with proposed new record holders for the world's tallest, including the New York wheel at 630 feet and the Dubai Eye at 690 feet. And there is a picture of Mr. Ferris. The end. Well, George Washington Gale Ferris had a lot of perseverance, meaning he didn't give up. No matter what happened or what people said, he still kept moving along and believed in himself. It's a wonderful trait to have. Now for your activity. The World's Fair was designed as a place for people all over the world to get together and share different ideas and new ways of life. I want you to think, if there was a World's Fair today here in the United States of America, what do you think would or should be a part of it? Share those ideas with us. Go to stpsb.org and you will find three ways in which you could submit your pictures or your drawings or your writings to share with us what you think could be a part or should be a part of the next World's Fair if it were held right here in the United States of America. Thank you for joining me today for Mr. Ferris and his wheel. And remember to keep learning and keep reading. And now a message from Burrow. Burrow says keep learning and keep reading. Right, Burrow?